Well, it's been my habit to begin these uh, podcasts with bringing in some object or book or something that has uh, meaning in my life. And this one is right at the epicenter of that. This little book is called Checkbook of the Bank of Faith by Charles Spurgeon. Uh, I don't know how else to say this, but this is magnificent gospel writing. It, it just blows my mind. Uh, you can see on the page here how short these uh, writings are, and yet with an economy of words, he has, he has the ability to get to the center of our need for Jesus, the magnificence of God's love for us, the danger of the disease of sin. It's just, it's just incredible. And I was laughing with my wife Luella this morning because this is her copy, and she started turning down the corner of the pages, the ones she wanted to remember, and she ended up turning down every page of, of this book uh, because they are so meaningful. So whatever else I'm, I'm doing for my personal time of worship, uh, this is part of it, and I am so thankful for Spurgeon. I'm so thankful that this stuff has been written and preserved uh, for generations, and uh, I am daily convicted and encouraged and motivated, and my gratitude is deepened, and I'm reminded that I am so far away from being a Grace graduate um, that I need God's grace every moment of my life and Spurgeon has really been uh, used to, to just remind me of that. So this is called The Checkbook of the Bank of Faith Daily Readings by Charles Spurgeon. Uh, if you don't have it, you should get it and get multiple copies and give it away. So I'm uh, enthused about uh, this morning and I've been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, my guest uh, today is Ross Wilson. Ross is a renowned artist from Ireland, lives in Northern Ireland, and um, I love his work, but I have a deeper respect for how he's negotiated this world as a committed Christian and his love for the Lord and love for the gospel informs just everything he he does uh, he's taught at spoken at Oxford and Cambridge and tons of other other places so uh, Russ it's great we can we can do this so I would like to, uh, as I always do, I want to get you to tell a little bit of your story, uh, talk about growing up, what family life was like, and then we want to move into how you sense that this world of art is where you ought to spend your, your life. So you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's really great to be here. Um, I grew up as a, uh, a child in a country area. Um, my mum's family came from a farming background. My father was from the city, from Belfast. So I spent part of my childhood um, in that rural area, and that really had a big impact on my life. Um, I think that most children are excited by seeing things. Mm. Um, seeing is a spiritual thing because it involves light on many different levels. Mm. Um, light gives form to things. Light helps to see things as they should be. And as a, as a child, I was completely mesmerized by just being able to wake up every morning and see things, mm. especially in a, in a country, um, in a farming environment, because the seasonal change was really um, dramatic. And lots of things were happening on the land. And I had relatives who were working farmers. And as a child, going and sitting on a tractor and walking into the fields to find them and 
they, they were people who worked really hard. So I was completely taken by this whole world of nature, um, God's world. Um, as a child in that area, um, I went to Sunday school. Um, I didn't really always understand it, but the guy who taught me in Sunday school is still alive and mm. still still teaching in Sunday school, I think. And he had a big impact in my life. The minister of the church, which was a Presbyterian church, um, was a very godly man, and he spoke about Christ. I didn't really know anything about Christ, but I knew um, it must have been an important subject for someone like him to sort of every Sunday want to let people know about it. Were your parents believers? Um... My mum grew up in that church, it was a Presbyterian church, and um, my mum was such an encouragement to me. So I do believe, maybe at some stage in my mum's youth, she had a faith interaction, but both my mum and dad in later life um, became really active and um, dynamic Christians. Hmm. So, um, you know, my dad was like the prodigal father. Um, he wasn't... <laughs> You know, growing up as a, as a child, he was my hero. Then, as I got into my teens, I, I started to see things about my father that maybe weren't traits that I would have admired. Mm. And um, he had his he had his issues, like a lot of fathers do. Um, but my mom and my father were all always encouraging. Um, so I I sort of had a really beautiful childhood, which still nurtures and nourishes me st you know to mm. this day so those 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 moments i can remember moments of being on the back of a bicycle being taken to a relative's farm and, and the trees whizzing past you know i still sometimes go and drive on that road to try and rekindle that experience mm. so that whole visual creative thing nature um it was like almost like a i don't know like a like like another form of like revelation, mm. um, just this idea of seeing. And I think all children are like that until the education system gets a hold of them. And then, you know, it educates them out of, you know, the, the important the important aspects of, of seeing, of seeing things. Yeah, because uh, there's that narrow belt of sort of an academic way of thinking about life and it, it diminishes what you've been talking about yeah so as a child the experiences i had were i could say without wanting to be too fancy were very cosmic um in, in the sense that they tapped into god's creation and i didn't know it i sensed it um this connection between the temporal and the eternal and i do remember on a certain river which i've never been able to go back to because I, I wouldn't want to go back as an adult maybe kill the memory um, but there were moments that we would call in Ireland or in, in, in Celtic regions like thin places where almost a moment of time touches a moment of eternity mm. and even if you have that for a microsecond um, it stays with you all your life and I had those moments as a child and I would call them a sense of wonder mm. so uh, were you were you doing artistic things? Were you drawing as a child? Or um, yeah, I mean, I just thought every kid did that, you know. Um, and um, I lived with my grandmother for a while in the summer holidays. Any any time I had, I would go and stay with her. And she lived in this old, big old farmhouse, which had sort of like Georgian windows, which are broken up into panels. Hmm. Which, as a little kid, I realized, you know, if I did a drawing and stuck it in the panel of the window, then my friends, as they were walk, walking past the house, could see the, uh, the exhibition. So I had my first exhibition in the window of my grandmother's house. Um, and um, thinking back on that, then I thought, why did I do that? You know, it's a bit narcissistic. <laughs> but um, there was this wanting to share. Yeah. And at that time, I was just doing drawings, like maybe like comic book drawings and and things like that but um, I had this I, I mean this not not urge but like a need to well w wanting to share what I'd seen with others and um, even at that young age that would be maybe six seven years old um, was a big thing for me um, and I even used to walk past her house and 
look at my own work in the window um, as a child. But those experiences were very important um, and were very much part of my socialization into not only seeing things, but sharing what you see. Hmm. So as you get older, does, does that develop more? Yeah. It becomes a bit more complex because as a child, um, things are seen in a simpler way. Hmm. Um, the baggage that we carry along with us in life sometimes intrudes in the vision and sometimes can complicate the vision. Um, but um, I still now and again have moments of clarity. <laughs> so uh, talk about then going into university and were you an art major? Yeah, I was the first person in my family to go to university. And, and I have to mention at this stage, my schooling, I went to a high school and I, in the high school, boy, it was a boys and girls school. And um, boys did not do art. Boys did technical drawing, mm. which was like geometrical drawing. Yeah. So um, about three weeks into that, I was really bored out of my head, but I used to do s sketches and little sketch pads all the time. So I put my hand up in the uh, class and said to the teacher, um, I want to transfer fur to art. And everybody stopped and looked. <laughs> and it was like a sort of like a really uh, big moment. And the teacher, he was quite, you know, um, open to listen, said, well, I mean, are you good at art? I said, well, I've got some sketchbooks here. I showed him the sketchbooks. He said, okay, um, and he sent a boy from the class. He didn't send me, but he sent a boy with the sketch pads to the art teacher. Um, and then the boy came back and the art teacher came with him. And she said, who did these? And I went, said, okay, come with me. So I transferred to art. Then all my friends realized that in the art class, it was all girls. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of other people wanted to transfer, but they didn't really have the goods to back it up. <laughs> and I was the only boy in the art class. Um, and that teacher, um, her name was Sheila Doris. She changed my life. She was the one who flicked the switch on. And she showed empathy, belief, and um, encouragement to me. And I, I, as a 13, 14 year old, um, that was a big thing to get that for something that you do. What did she see? Um, she saw like a raw ability and talent and um, she believed in it. I mean, I sensed that. And I was the first student in my school to do A-level art, which is like a you do this when you're 16 for two years. It's mm -hmm. like a pretty high pitched exam. And there was four of us started off doing it. And after two weeks, the other three dropped out. And I was the only student left, and she couldn't take a class for me, so she timetabled me into the into her free period classes where she wow. was off. Wow. She put me into junior classes where she didn't have to focus so much, you know, on individual students because they were all quite, you know, like focused and listened. So she would teach me in the back of those classes, um, and she let me stay after school to five o'clock. I mean, I would stay most days at five o'clock, which was a little eccentric. What a provision of God for you. I mean, it's just, that's incredible. So I didn't know at the time, but it was like my studio. School was my studio. Yeah. But I had to do all these other exams and I couldn't get my head around why I had to do these other exams to get in university. And I remember saying to her one day, but Vincent van Gogh didn't have to do exams to go to university. She said, yep, yeah, you're not Vincent van Gogh. <laughs> um, I thought, right, okay. Um, but she changed my life. And that it was a conversation that lasted about eight minutes and I'm now um, I'm still involved with that school and I go back and I do go back to the school I go to that spot where she had the conversation There's, it's a tiled floor and I can re still remember those tiles as she stood and spoke to me for about eight minutes and the light came on so what did she say in those eight minutes she said you have to do these exams to get into university and you need to go through them and you need to pass them. And you need to think of this as a hurdle race. And now you can see the track and you can see each hurdle with the name of the exam and you need to get over that. And once you get over it and you get to the finish line, which will be university, you will never need to go back and go over those hurdles again. And like, wow. I saw it. She knew I was a visual learner, so she put it into a visual language. Yeah. 
and I can still see the hurdles and the O level English and the the other exams, you know, um, that I had to achieve to get the grades to go to, to study. So, um, talk about university and your experience there. Um, well, going to university was like um, playing for Manchester United in the 1968 European Cup final <laughs> when they beat Benfica. Um, for those Manchester United fans listening, um, it was just a gift. Uh, my mum worked in a factory near my university and she started at 7.30 in the morning and I used to get her to drop me off at college at 7.15. <laughs> so I was in college painting before the cleaning staff came in. Wow. And they would come in and th thought I'd been there all night, you know. Um, but I just couldn't believe it, that I could get up in the morning and go to the place where I could paint all day. I mean, I had to go to some lectures and all that kind of stuff, but that was easy because it was about something you loved. Mm. So I think my first foundation year, I painted 350 pictures. Wow. Um, I just couldn't stop it. And that was one of the most important years of my life in terms of creativity, um, was that freedom to go. I had a brother, a young brother. He was a really hardworking guy. He had a little coal business where he delivered coal. And he used to have to live these, lift these big bags of coal um, every day. And I would hear many, many a morning when I was still in bed, going out really early um, to lift coal in, in the snow and the frost. And I thought, he's going to have to lift like 100 weight bags of coal. And all I have to do is lift the brush, mm. you know? So if I could work as hard as him, um, at my art, you know, what's not to like? So what, what is the state of your faith at that, that time? At that time, it was still a state of wonder. It wasn't um, a focused or a, um, a, a regenerative faith. It was um, more to do with this idea of wondering, is there a God? Um, and if there is a God, how can I know him? Does he know me? Um, that, that turned a corner when my mum one day went out to buy the Sunday papers and came back with the Bible instead of the Sunday papers. And she said, I think you need this. Hmm. And she gave me this Bible, it was in a paper bag. As soon as I grasped it, I knew it was a Bible. Um, and I, I did remember as a kid, maybe a few things, but not a lot. And I remember opening the Bible, just, well, sort of randomly, but, you know, like a preset randomness um, at Romans chapter 8, when it talked about the idea of the spirit and the flesh. And I remember at college, in, those, in that first year, I was painting landscapes. And they were very atmospheric and very ethereal, and, you know, they did sort of like, could it hit your heart in a way? And people used to come to me and say, look, these paintings have spirit. And that was a big thing then about this idea of having spirit in your work. Mm. And I said, no, they don't have spirit. It's basically a combination of Prussian blue and olive green. <laughs> um, it's not hard to create spirit if that's what it is. I knew it wasn't. I knew it was some form of spirit, but I knew that that was not spirit. Mm. That spirit was something deeper and bigger. And this idea of living on the, a level that can't please the spirit and a level that pleases the flesh, um, were, so, were something, some things that I considered when I read that chapter in Romans. And that was on the Sunday morning. On the Sunday evening, I thought, weirdly, I should go to church. So I convinced my cold man brother, he had a car, to take me to this little like, country church where no one would see me because I didn't see me going to church. And he came in with me because he was giving me a lift. He had to wait. <laughs> So he sat through the sermon, and we were, I sat in the very back row, and the, the preacher got up and preached from Romans chapter 8. Wow. And I was sort of, I, I remember seeing three people's heads in the pews in front of me, but I could see the words coming down, you know, in my mind's eye, the words coming from him, coming through the people I was trying to hide behind and getting to me. And usually at the end of the service, the minister would walk down, from the pulpit to the door and shake people's hands before they went out. But I was out the door before I even got out of the pulpit because I thought, this is weird. You know, I need to get, I need to get out of this place. And my brother was driving me home and uh, he said, did that do you any good? I said, it, 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 you won't believe 
oh, that's impacting me. So I got home, um, went, went upstairs to my room, thought I need to go and speak to that minister. So my brother had gone out, so I had to walk back up to where I sort of knew where the manse was and walked up to the manse door and knocked the door. And he came to the door and um, he was sort of surprised to see me. It was like after the service on Sunday evening. I think it was probably about maybe nine o'clock at that stage. And he said, how can I help you? I said, I know I need to find Christ. Can you help me do that? Wow. Uh, and he brought me in. And um, he talked to me. We had a conversation for two hours. And he says, it's late. And, um, but you need to tell someone. You need to go and tell someone tonight about this new beginning. So I knew when I went home, I could tell my mom, but I knew an old lady who lived, um, I used to go and visit with my mom. I thought, I'll go and tell her. I mean, this is not about 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, well, I didn't think she'd be in bed, but obviously she was in her 80s, um, but her light was still on. So I knocked her door and I said, Blanche, um, can I can I come in and just have a conversation? She said, yeah, come on, what, what is it? Are you okay? I said, yeah, I'd just like to say it. Um, I've come to a point of faith tonight where I've realized that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that I have had an encounter with Christ. And she said, that's amazing. I've been praying for you for years. Mm. Um, so that really touched me in a, in a big place, um, that she cared to do that. And that I didn't realize that she was doing that. And that her love of me um, made her do that. I. I say this all the time on these podcasts. I, I love these stories of how God's grace works in individual lives because God accomplishes the same thing in, in all of us, but every story is unique and different. Just the, It's magnificent the way God knows exactly what you need, exactly how to get at your heart, exactly how to expose himself to you, exactly how to give you a knowledge of sin. It's just mind-boggling. And I've sat here and heard so many incredible stories. Every single one of them is unique. Yet Grace is doing the same thing in everybody's life. It's just, it's just such a beautiful thing. Uh, this one who sits on the throne of the universe, who rules everything, yet is his tender-hearted care for individuals. Who gives a rip about Ross Wilson in Northern Ireland? What difference does it make? But it does to God. Hmm. Well, I, I, I understood that that night and I sat with her till quite late and then walked home. Um, my mom had gone to bed. I mean, I was like, at this age, I, I'd have been maybe 19, 20. Um, and I remember sitting down in the settee and falling asleep. My mom came down in the morning and said, you, is everything okay? I said, yes, mom, you know, I had an encounter with Christ last night. And um, she, was, she, she started to cry. And I thought, mom, don't be sad. She said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joyful. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I, my mom also um, had such an impact in my life. Um, but that, that lady Blanche, who worked in a textile mill for 60 years, um, was a, a woman of prayer who, who touched my life um, and became a really important person to me in my life. So talk about the transformation that takes place as a result of this newfound relationship with Jesus. Um, well, um, I thought in the first week my brothers would become Christians. I'd convert them. <laughs> um, so it was like a like a theological version of Dumb and Dumber, um, <laughs> where I just thought this is all going to, everything's going to change. Um, my dad, I mean, will, you know, change. Um, that didn't happen. My brothers resisted. Um, you know, they were kind, but they were saying, look, you stop preaching to us now. Why, why are you starting to do this preaching stuff? Mm. Um, and then I pulled back. Um, I do remember buying my dad a Bible and giving it to him. And my dad would have went out every Thursday night and had a drink and maybe maybe had one drink too many. And I remember coming home one night, my dad was sitting reading the Bible. And as a young student, you know, I didn't really think very much, but I thought, Dad, you shouldn't be reading that Bible when you're drunk. <laughs> maybe that's the best time to read it. <laughs> he took the Bible and threw it at me and I didn't see it again for a long time. Hmm. 
And I thought, we need to be careful what you say and when you say it and how you say it. And I had a lot of learning to do. Um, I then met this young guy who came to look after the church because the minister had moved on and there was a young Bible student um, guy, um, theology student who'd come as a placement, but they asked me to stay on until they, and um, he was he was maybe 10 years older than me. And um, um, his name was Colin Redmond. He's in New Zealand and he really impacted my life. Mm. Um, and he, he took, I mean, I, I thought it was, I wanted to be a minister at that stage. So he took me out with, with many visitations and I made some really major mistakes, you know, when we visiting people and things that you say. And um, he says, maybe you, should, you need to reconsider, <laughs> <laughs> consider your vocation. Um, but he really encouraged me and um, his influence still is with me all these years later. And that's a long time ago now. Um, so then um, I found this group of young Christians in Belfast who were from different backgrounds, who'd all found Christ and the troubles were still on then. It was a big thing politically. It was like, you know, like sectarianism, but these were young people who'd come from Catholic backgrounds, Protestant backgrounds, who'd come to a faith in Christ. Mm. And they used to go into Belfast on a Saturday afternoon and do open air work and, and preach and sing. And I was just standing there looking at these guys who were just like ordinary but they were so articulate and so mesmerizing in terms of how they could reach out into the marketplace with truth. Mm. And I thought, that's unbelievable. So I used to go with them and then I would, they would let me give out tracts at that stage. So I mean, didn't say anything or I didn't have a lot of theology, theology knowledge. And I remember giving the tract to a girl I saw he was in my year at college because this was the summertime before I went back to my final year. And she thought I was doing this as a joke and making fun of the Christians. And her name is Carmel. And she, she said, why are you doing this, Ross? It's not funny. I said, it's not, I, I am a Christian now. And she ran off screaming. <laughs> she did, she actually ran, she, she freaked out. So the time I got back to college, that had all come out that I had this conversion to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I remember my professor, who I sort of respected quite a bit, pull, asked to see me. And he, he pulled me into his office and he said, um, I hear you've got religion. And even as a, like a stupid young Christian, I knew that was not the term. Um, I said, no, I, I don't have religion, I've, I've got Christ. Oh, you'll grow out of that. I said, no, actually, I'll grow into it. <laughs> um, he said, like, just leave. <laughs> so I thought, why did he pull me in like that? Um, I mean, what was that all about? So then um, my work changed a bit because it became more focused on God the Creator and that I was a sub-creator. That I was some something that was like that I was able to observe his creation and that I could translate that in a way. I mean, Lewis talks about this idea of being a translator, mm. of helping people to see complicated things in a simple way. So I wanted to try and do that with my work to help people see God's creation. So I did my degree show was based on that, um, on Psalm ninety one, and um, that. That was a big thing. And then I led on to a postgrad master's degree in Chelsea School of Art in London. And in London, I went to Westminster Chapel and All Souls. And John Stott was at All Souls. And I yeah. stayed with this Christian couple in Camden Town who, who actually helped change my life as well, theologically. They were so grounded. And they were, one was a graphic designer and one was an illustrator for Vogue magazine. And they were young and they were like, they weren't much older than me. And I thought, wow, these are Christians living like the life, a life of creativity, mm. you know, they can, this can be done, you know, and they were like not long married and they lived in this little house in Camden Town. And I still am in touch with them every week. And that was 1982. Um, they really changed my life. So um, my art teacher had that big impact um, where she showed that I had this ability and that she believed in it. And then this couple, you know, started to make me think about theology in a, in, in, a, in a big way and how that theology is part of your creativity and that it should affect what you do. And they introduced me to people like Francis Schaeffer and other writers. And one of my favorite sort of quotes of Schaeffer is that no work of art is more important than the Christian's life. Mm. And every Christian is called to be an artist in this sense. Mm. The Christian life is to be a thing of truth and beauty in the midst of a dark and despairing world. 
Um, so their impact helped to season me up um, to come when I when I came back from London to then survive as an artist because no one had given me any business training or no one had said you do this and do that and do the other. Um, you're basically left after your degree or your master's degree on the pavement with a folder full of paintings and drawings and then like the world's starting to come fast at you. How do you survive? How do you make it through? How do you articulate your faith in a secular world um, in a way that has quality and and uh, a, a kind of nobleness about it? Um, so I had to learn all those things. Yeah, it impresses me as you're talking that how God in his uh and his love for you and his his zeal for his work raises up these people in your life that and it's true of all of us that give us things that we need before we even know we need them uh you're not going to london thinking i need this underbelly of theology to help me but god knows that you need that and he raises up people that give you that hmm. and also teach you that if you're going to survive, there's a there's a business to to art, and if you don't know that, you're you're just never going to make it. Hmm. It's it's amazing again. It just the picture of the individual, tender-hearted, uh, unceasing care of God for His children, providing what we need, even when we're not smart enough to know that these are the things that we need. It's it's just magnificent. Yeah. Um, that's also put into me this idea of encouraging others. Hmm. Um, anytime I get or any opportunity, I will do it. You know, it's it's oxygen oxygen to the soul. Encouragement is something we all need. Um, we all need to be inspired and encouraged by other people. And even if it's just maybe one person a year that encourages you in, in the right way, that can have a lasting effect. Hmm. And so it's something that we need to be re respectful to and and responsible to um, and not to discourage others because it's so easy to do that there are so many Christians with the blessed gift of discouragement yeah that's for sure oh my goodness <laughs> the blessed gift of discouragement so you're you finish there in London what happens next um, I come back to Northern Ireland um, and I have to try and start to make some money um, survive and um, I then eventually get some part-time part -time teaching but know that that's not really what I should be doing um, but I found that really interesting and I didn't meet inspirational teachers um, in, in a school I taught in and um, I realized very quickly I, I mean if I stayed there I would get into this routine of having a wage check um, which was a very beautiful thing for all you people out there who have wage checks coming in every month, um, I've never ever experienced that since then, um, never. And I didn't realize the fumbling, stumbling um, way that I walked away from that, in a sense, security into this complete insecurity of not knowing what's gonna happen next. Mm -hmm. And that still is with me. Um, I think most artists would realize that, that you don't really, you can't make a, like a, like a long-term forecast. So, but at that at that stage, you know, I, I believe very strongly I should do that, and um, that helped strengthen me a lot. Helped me realize that you need to be careful with your finances, and that that when you buy or when someone buys a painting, that you need to be careful with how you use that money, and that money should be used to help promote all the things that you're doing down the line, like even buying picture frames and materials and all that kind of thing. You know, so it was like a an organic business course um, that no one had planned that I sort of find myself in the middle of that you're sort of making up as you go along and um, you know that was that was an important aspect that I think kids don't get taught especially gra art graduates mm. they need that kind of help yeah you know because Luella has been in the gallery business for years we've been around working artist, you know, for a couple decades. And here in the States, it's almost impossible to live off your art. 
it's very, very difficult. And almost everyone that Luella has worked with is teaching on the side or doing something else because they just can't can't make it work. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's more difficult in Ireland. It's a smaller place. Um, it's a cultural place in, 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 in many ways. But in, in America, I, I see from some of the artists that I know um, who are, you know, quite successful that that the market is a it's a it's a bigger market. And if you can tap into that in some way with like your unique selling point, your yeah. unique view of life, then if that hits, that's great. But it is a difficult pathway. And I've said to people, parents who've said, my son, my daughter wants to study art, they're, they're tormented because they don't really know how to deal with it. Um, not to discourage their child. You know, if they really believe that's what they should do, they'll, they'll do it. Um, and um, that's something that um, I think you have to be careful about as well, not to discourage in that aspect. Um, even if it's, it's a lot of it's about the unknown. Yeah, you know, uh, we we felt as parents that God is the giver of gifts to our children, and we don't have a vote. And it it's not going to go anywhere good to stand in the way of that giftedness and the passion that com- comes out of that. And we we thought our calling was to encourage that anywhere, any way we could, uh, with my. Ola's son, Justin, who's a musician, I mean, it was early classical guitar lessons for him. And for Ethan, who ended up going to art school, it was little summer art classes for him as an eight-year-old. Anything we could do to help encourage uh, those gifts rather than I mean, parents stand away of those because they think, how is this child going to live? Mm-hmm. How, you know... How will they ever have a family? And, you know, you ask all those fearful questions and then you say no. Uh, And you stand in the way of what God has designed this human being to do. Hmm. And creativity, you know, goes all through life. It's not just in the arts. Yeah. Um, It's how you bring a child up. It's how you speak to a person who needs help. It's how you approach someone before they need they before they realize they they, they need help um, creativity comes out in so many different ways well you you one of the ways you see that is when you when you walk into somebody's house it's different than yours hmm. their sense of beauty is different than you the way things are laid out the way they take care of their things it's there's an, there's a expression of that person whether they realize or not they've created an environment that is home to them and when you enter that it doesn't feel like home to you because it's somebody else's creative world yeah well you must have been visiting lots of nice creative homes Paul because I've been in lots of places where there's a lack of creativity in terms of their interior and things like that but you know even within that there are things that you see that people do in their homes or or even how they you know like simple things it's 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 not just creativity is part of our god's dna in us you know it's part of our identity um and this is a big thing i've been banging my head off this wall for decades that the church needs to realize this and the church needs to embrace creativity the church needs to use it more in its in its worship it did that way back um we have neglected it now we've ostracize creativity out of our worship so so let's let's go there since you've you've started this i, I want to talk about the church and art uh the gospel and art uh what are we missing and what are the implications of what we're missing well i mean if you go and visit any european city even any older British city and you go to a cathedral and you walk in um, you're impacted by what the church believed um, would bring a sense of wonder awe and a sense of worship to the person who interacts with the church and, and that's even before anybody opens their mouth you know or before a, a note is played um, in our contemporary culture of church um, the one creative gift that's used is music that's basically it i'm not sure it might be different in your church the last time you had a poet speaking at the front of the church or you had someone play a beautiful piece of bach 
or you know someone you know shared this story about a painting you know um that's impacted their life um I'm, I, you know i think you have to be cautious about some of these things but i think that those things uh, if introduced in the right way would help enrich a service especially in our in our culture where focus is becoming you know like li more limited in terms of time um that we need to engage in other ways within a church service and that we have sort of almost sucked the wonder out of church and worship you know by i don't I mean I, I don't mean a disrespect by this but by sometimes majoring in the mundane and um i know certainly um sometimes the things you have to sit through in church to get to where the richness is is a bit like going through a swamp um, to get to this beautiful place hmm. um so i do think we've neglected it and even how we interpret ourselves outside our churches you know because uh, there's lots of people who are going to pass our church buildings who will not come inside so how do we get their attention how do we trigger a thought about redemption about sin about um about love um how do we do that um how does the world do those sort of things it does it by putting billboards and signage up and catching people's attention in traffic and so i've been pushing this idea about how we visualize ourselves outside of church you know how we can engage with people who may not come in that may make them think that may trigger some thoughts that may actually make them think I'm going to go to a service there someday and find out what that's all about. So we have sort of like pulled back from all that richness of the visual, um, from all that richness of, of literature. Um, and certainly we've sort of majored in, in a generic sense in one particular style of music. And I think that personally, um, that needs to be looked at. Yeah, it's, it, I gave you this this, this morning a, a poetry book and it was a conscious decision by the publisher to call it a book of meditations because if they called it a book of poetry no one would pick it up. That's where we are. Yeah. Yeah. It's good marketing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sad marketing though. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it's all part of the alphabet of grace. You know, all these things are part of the alphabet of grace. And we've left letters out of our alphabet. So we become more um, inarticulate because of the loss of those, those words, those letters. Um, and meditation is a, a really important thing. Um, it's like a code word for almost like prayer. Um, and pilgrimage as well is another thing that we neglect in terms of striving towards something or going towards something um, and growing as a Christian. So we need to engage with culture in a, in a bigger and deeper way. Mm -hmm. And we have been so, it's like reversing up a, a one-way street. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not been a good experience. One of the people that I've appreciated who's written on this, who's now gone, is Eugene Peterson. And he talks about the importance of imagination and says that we need uh, artists and poets and, and novelists and playwrights to expand our imagination. And he talks about imagination not being the ability to conjure up what is unreal, but the ability to see what is real but unseen and how we need our imaginations stimulated. And as a pastor, that became something that was very, very important to him. Imagination is a very important part of faith. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about that, but if you if you go back in Christian writing, uh, often imagination is used as replacement for the word faith mm -hmm. because it's such an important part of this belief. Uh, and we aren't doing things in the Christian community to stimulate people's imaginations a lot of people leave their imagination in the car park um, before they go into church um, they park that um, with lots of other things and yeah I mean those things are enriching things and I think you have to be cautious in some areas because there, there are people who's sometimes their imagination would run away with them um, as we say in Ireland but um, WB it's the Irish poet talk about this idea of imagination bringing a liberty 
um, whereas other things, you know, enclose you. Imagination has a, and, and Lewis would talk about that as well. I mean, he reimagined things so we could understand, mm. and um, especially in those children's books. Um, so we need to. Um, in, uh, I'm just going to push this as a as an artist. We need to encourage those young people, old people, whatever age, but especially young people um, in our churches, in our fellowships, in our gatherings, who are the writers, the poets, the musicians, the painters, the sculptors. You know, who are involved in those high profile creative things. We did we did en encourage our culture generally, but we need to encourage those people because they're going to be the the people who take it forward and who are the tip of the iceberg culturally for us and um you know that that's why i mean one of my missions in life is to encourage all young artists and it's so important you know mm -hmm. because if i can get encouragement as a young student in 1982 by a young couple who lived in camden town who were thinking christians and creative christians that's impacted my life until now you know we have a responsibility to do that and we have to nurture and help grow those young people within our church system. Otherwise, we're, we're in one sense, we're culturally lost. So what is, what is your life like as an artist in the church? Um, are you understood? Are you appreciated? Are you just considered weird? Well, you may be considered weird anyway. But, are, you know, what's that like for you? Okay, can we pass on to the next question, please? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure what to say about this because I know there'll be some people in my church probably watching this. Um, and I... Um, <laughs> um, I mean, there are people who encourage you as a person. Yeah. And that's great. And we all need that first and foremost. You know, and... Um, I think in church, sometimes we need to engage more with that kind of conversation with people. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in your church, but I think in a lot of churches, people want, want to get away after the service. Okay, there's tea and coffee, and there's like conversation, that's really important. But I think it's probably making contact, you know, with people throughout the week or in between, and being particularly focused about trying to encourage someone. Hmm. Um, I don't, it's not a big issue for me whether I'm encouraged or not uh, in, in that sense. Um, um, it's it's a bigger issue for me to encourage other people, and uh, if I see that, you know, maybe there should be more encouragement, then it's my responsibility to to be part of that. Um, but I do think, from what I've picked up, when I teach students one one day a week, actually American students in in Ireland, on on a, on a our studies program, and it's amazing to work with those. So I I try to encourage those young people. Most of them are creative. A lot of them don't know it, um, and they're not all art majors. They're in different things, but they've come to do an Irish studies program, and I teach Irish art in that program. So I, I would try to encourage them as much as I can to interact with cultural things, and I've seen that work so well, even in the last in my year of teaching, and it's just one day a week. Um, how you can impact and influence someone for good with beautiful enriching material which there's an abundance of mm. in terms of art literature music um, um, even political thought in terms of how we um, put these things out into community um, so that encouragement thing is really important coming back to that again um, I do think the, the church has um, the, the, the church in one sense has not benefited benefit from having more artists, creative people as part of their congregations or are not encouraging the ones that they do have. Yeah. So I went to a German Lutheran school uh, as a little boy and maybe three or four times a year we would all get on a bus we'd go to the art museum in Toledo, Ohio and We'd go downstairs in the art, muse art museum and we'd pick up these little green cushions, leather cushions with a little handle on them. And a docent would 
take us to a certain part of the museum and we'd all sit down and she'd open our eyes. And I talk about that to Luella all the time. That experience just marked me. Um, I, I, it, it was as if somebody was giving, she had this ability to give young children eyes to see what they wouldn't see without her. I had another experience where uh, my parents were living next to somebody who went to our church and uh, the lady was a working artist and she came over one Saturday morning and said, I'm taking my daughter to the zoo. Would you like to go uh, along with us? And so I said, oh, I'd love, I'd love to go. So she took us to the zoo and I can remember we got the first enclosure we went to was tigers and as kids would do, we looked at it for about three seconds and we were going to run to the next place. She said, stop, you haven't seen the tiger. And she stood there and just did a mini lecture about every aspect of the beauty of that, of that animal. Uh, and I think those, those two experiences were both experiences of an adult who cared enough to give children eyes to see Really, what we're talking about is the glory of God in creation. Mm -hmm. You are, those moments, you are in, encountering the Creator, whether you know it or not. And uh, here I am, obviously not a young man anymore. And I have the distinct memory of those experiences I've carried with me and the, the, the impact of those experiences. I've I've said to Luella, I'd love to be able, both those people are gone, to go back and thank them for taking mm -hmm. the time to do that. Yeah, that's, that's profound. And you never, you, you just never know how a word of encouragement or stopping and spending time with somebody will literally change the traje trajectory of their lives. Yeah, and, and that's another thing that we need to be um, aware of, you know, th this idea of teaching and those people that we know who are teachers, and especially those people we know who are teachers who have faith, um, we need to encourage them because teaching is one of the most creative acts. Like John Steinbeck said that, the American writer, that you know, to be a teacher is one of the most creative um, activities you could be involved in. You know, the shaping of, the shaping and directing of a young mind, it's profound. Um, and that's a big responsibility. And those people who, you know, um, who have that access um, need to be encouraged. Yeah, and I, I also think of my teachers there at the Lutheran School, Carl, Carl Obst and Rudolf Ranke, why they thought that was important. I mean, they, it was a normal school with all the academic things you'd expect, but somehow they thought that investment at the art museum was important to the uh, healthy development of these these children. For that, I'm neither one of them were, as I remember, sort of artistic, whatever that means, guys. But mm. they nailed that into the schedule. It's a good schedule. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. So. Uh, you are, you have done uh, a lot of public artwork, uh, some incredible sculptures that I've been, that are in public places that I've been uh, privileged to see. And um, I don't know if all of them are, but many of those are based on biblical or Christian themes. Talk about that experience. How, how do how do you how did you go in that direction? Where did that idea come from? What is it like to work in the in a public <coughs> space like that? Um, I'm I'm not a sculptor. I'm a painter who does some sculpting. Um, I didn't train as a sculptor, um, so my techniques are pretty weird. Um, and can I just say the results are pretty magnificent? <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed at that compliment, but thank you. Um, my first sculpture project, I talked my way into it with a brewing company called Bass, who are big beer brewers in Ireland, um, and convinced them I could do a sculpture they're putting a commission out to. And I, I, I got this commission and realized I don't know anything about sculpture. But I also found the experience of working with Bass, the brewing company, very sobering. <laughs> Because it was my first real interaction with sculpture and I didn't know what to do. I mean, I went away and found a guy, a sculptor guy, an older guy. And in an afternoon, he gave me like a real crash course on some simple techniques. And I fumbled my way through this commission. Um, and it's a, co a cooper, a barrel maker. Mm. And it's a guy sitting on a barrel, with a big cloth cap from the 1890s. And um, that was my first sculpture. And that was the year before a really important sculpture happened. And it was around the year 1979, um, oh, 19, sorry, 1997. Um, um, a couple of years before that, I met Keith um, when he was just starting out. Um, Keith Getty, the hymn writer. Um, a very, a very um, important friend, and as a young guy starting out, someone who needed encouragement, um, but who had this like energy, mm. and um, it was centenary um, of uh, C.S. Lewis's birth, and there was nothing happening. This is in Belfast, like yeah. where he was born. Uh, we went to a lecture in Queens, and like ten minutes, and I was starting to those it was like it was it was dry it was terrible and we thought we needed to do something so Keith thought I'm going to write a musical called Jack and he he proceeded to do that and he was working with Douglas Gresham on part of that in terms of research and I went down to see Keith when he was staying with Douglas way back um, 1997 this would have been and um um in Douglas Gresham's study, there was a letter, and that letter was a letter written by C.S. Lewis to a 10-year-old girl in 1961, two years before he died. He was um, he was teaching in uh, Cambridge at that stage, and this young girl had written to him and, and asked, because she'd been reading one of the books, um, why Aslan, the great lion, had to die. Why did the Great One give himself up hmm. for the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve? So she asked her mum this question. She lived in um, Suffolk on a chicken farm, and her mum had no clue. Her mum said, why don't you write to the person who wrote the book? So she wrote to C.S. Lewis, like lots of kids did, and um, this was the letter that he replied. And it's like half a paragraph with a subheading for each one of the books. And it, it explains the whole Chronicles of Narnia in a paragraph. Um, there's been lots of books written about you know, what the meaning is, but he did it in the I've seen that paragraph. Um, and I read the letter, and like the hair stood up in the back of my neck, and I thought, this is unbelievable. Wow! It was just full of energy and grace and grace exchange. Because mm. Lewis sat down and wrote that letter to a child, um, taking time. It may have taken maybe ten minutes, could be fifteen minutes, but that was a time of grace exchange that he put into that letter and he put that letter into an envelope and he put that envelope into a post box and he put that letter into that child's life. So I, I want to I wanna stop you for a minute. Again, just the willingness for us to stop and take time to be a tool of grace in somebody else's life. We can be so busy self-focused walk by opportunities and miss them and one of the my mantras is God makes his invisible grace visible by sending people of grace to give grace to people need grace and that's one of those moments yeah. uh, here's this this old man who cares about this stupid little letter from a, a 10 year old but he did. And that's a moment of grace in this little girl's life because he was willing to, to take the time to do that. And 
every single one of us has those opportunities. There's no want for opportunities. No, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So I read the letter. It, it did something to me. Um, it was a metaphysical moment. Um, let's put it like that. And I thought I need to do something with this letter. Um, I should do a sculpture based on the letter. I didn't have a clue what was going to happen. There was no money. There was nothing. Um, I said to Douglas Gresham, can I have a photocopy of the letter? Yeah, sure, you can have a copy. So I took the letter home, and within three days, I traced the little girl. Um, he was 10 in 1961. This would have been 1997. And um, I remember lifting the phone when I got that number and said, hello, you don't know me, but my name's Ross Wilson. Did you write to C.S. Lewis when you were 10? She says, how do you know that? Um, I said, it was like a weird phone call, but I've just seen a letter he wrote back to you. Oh, where did you see that? That hasn't been published. I said, well, it, it's a photocopy that someone sent to somebody who sent it to somebody else. Um, could I use that as part of a sculpture project? Really? You'd want to use it? I said, yeah. She said, well, that's, that's amazing. That's the best news I've heard all year. Um, I said, could you tell me something about the letter? Yeah, well, I mean, I asked my mum, you know, why the lion, Aslan, gave himself up. She didn't know, so I wrote under her encouragement to the writer, Mr. Mr. Lewis. And to my surprise, he wrote back to me. And I remember my mum coming to my bedroom door. It was a Saturday morning on the farm, and she knocked the door and came in with a letter and said, who do you know in Cambridge? Because the stamp, Frank Mark, mm. had Cambridge on it. And she said, I opened that letter, and I read that letter. And I carried that letter in my pocket for two years. Wow. Mr. Lewis helped me find my faith. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. The impact of that letter in that child's life, um, Mr. Lewis helped me find my faith. So that, that idea of grace in the ink of those marks, in the words of that letter, in the mind of that man, um, pushed that into that child's life and changed her life. And um, so she, she very kindly gave me permission to use the letter. And I had no money for the sculpture. My niece, who's now um, 30, um, this is 25 years ago this year, gave me five pounds, 50 pence from her piggy bank to start the C.S. Lewis Sculpture Fund off. Wow. Um, which, the more I think about it now, the more profound that becomes. Um, I remember going to the, the city council and pitching the idea about the sculpture. And the guy said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll back it we'll give you 80% funding from the lottery. And I said, you know, this is going to sound really weird, but I don't think I could accept that. He said, what? How much is this going to cost? I said, it's going to cost around 80,000 pounds. How much money have you got in place? I said, five pounds <laughs> 50. He said, and you're, if you refuse, you're going to refuse 80% funding of that total amount? I said, I have <coughs> I, I, I know C.S. Lewis would, would hate the idea of this, you know, of lottery funding being used to commemorate his writing and his mission in life. And the guy just remorsed, you know, he, he told me to get out of his office. I said, is there no other funding that I can use um, that's not from the lottery? He said, there is, but you need to have much more funding in place and we could try and match it. Um, so, you know, just leave. So I'm leaving walking out of the council office having after having this conversation with the arts officer I'm walking down the street thinking this is never going to happen <clears throat> so within two weeks I get a phone call um, through a friend and a Christian guy in that part of East Belfast where Lewis grew up a business guy wanted to donate six and a half thousand pounds to help the sculpture fund start so I got on the phone made an appointment to see the arts officer again went back and told him I've now got six and a half thousand pounds and five pounds fifty. Um, he said, where did you get six and a half thousand pounds in two weeks? I said, well, it was, an, it was donated anonymously. Why would someone want to donate six and a half thousand pounds anonymously? I said, because they don't want to be known. Um, he didn't really <laughs> get it. He said, well, when you come to me with that money in an account and you have two uh, trustees, a Belfast City Councillor and an independent business trustee, and you show me that bank statement, then you can apply for some funding. And within another two weeks, that all happened. And I think the council ended up donating 10,000 pounds or 9,000 pounds. The rest of it, we had to get through all kinds of 
you know, like I always mention Punjana Tea, who are a local tea brewing company in Belfast because they give £2,000 and that was the major amount. Um, and so I've been drinking Punjana Tea since 1998. <laughs> And anywhere I go, I was mentioning it. I like to think I've repaid them, yeah, even just right. by the amount of tea I've drunk um, <laughs> since then. But that was a big thing. And um, NIE, the um, power company in Northern Ireland, gave ninety-five pounds. A multi-million pound company <laughs> gave ninety-five pounds. <laughs> this is true. I've never since nineteen ninety-eight paid a power bill on time. I've waited for that court letter. We're taking you to court. If you don't pay this, you're going to court. You could be fined ten thousand pounds, and you may go to jail. So I think probably I've got a couple of letters back home. I should have sorted out before I came here. Um, but I always get the red letter, and then go and pay it. Um, I thought ninety-five pounds, and I had to take that because we needed every penny, you know. So that 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 sculpture has been in place twenty-five years. Um, the response I got to the sculpture today was putting it. The day I was putting it in place, um, I left one day gap before it was unveiled, and it was unveiled on the birth of C.S. Lewis, the centenary of his birth. Um, a lady walked past with two shopping bags, and she said, it's a sculpture of a figure opening a wardrobe, uh, yeah. Diggory Kirk. Yeah, I remember it's it. It's this idea of accessing Narnia through the imagination. Yeah, I remember it. And the figure's holding a chair, and the idea is that you can sit in the chair and be transported through Lewis's imagination in Narnia. So this lady's walking past with two shopping bags, sculpture's being put up, life-size wardrobe, she says, I'll burn that wardrobe in a week, son. That wardrobe will be burnt in a week. I said, it's not actually a wooden wardrobe, it's bronze. It'll be burnt in a week. And she walks off and I thought, the encouragement, you know, the great encouragement. And then another guy walks up to me and right up to my face says, why are you putting up a sculpture of Lewis Carroll in East Belfast? I said, it's not Lewis Carroll, it's C.S. Lewis. What's Lewis Carroll got to do with East Belfast? I said, he walked off and I thought, this is a nightmare. This is not going well. <laughs> But an hour later, when I'm just finishing off, I feel my coat tugging. It, was, it had been raining that day and it stopped. I looked around and there's three little girls, like nine, ten-year-olds. Mister, is this to do with C.S. Lewis? I said, yeah, we love him. We're reading his book, The Land of Which the World Over. What's that chair for? I said, well, the chair is for children to sit on so that they can be transported through the imagination of C.S. Lewis into Narnia. Can we be the first ones to sit on it? I said, go ahead. And I had a little camera with me and I took a photograph of those three kids who'd now be in their mid-30s. And I'd love to try and get them back again, you know, 25 years later, to sit in the chair and to hear their stories about mm. what's happened in their lives. So that was all triggered by Lewis sitting down in his study uh, in Cambridge and writing a letter that explained the Chronicles of Narnia to a 10-year-old girl who lived in a farm in Suffolk. Mm. Mm. My... Uh I had a, in my early pastoral days, my office was on the third floor of our home and there's a big old wardrobe in that room and my son was, was reading Chronicles of Narnia. He was third grade maybe. And he came upstairs into my office said, Daddy, stand up. So I stood up. He grabbed my hand, took me in front of the wardrobe and said, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. He was, uh, he was thinking, man, if, if Narnia exists, I want to I wanna go there. So, so uh, you know, these, these sculptures need to be taken care of, don't they? Don't you worry about that after all the all the effort and all the work and um, some of the sculptures are community projects and for a while I did work um, which was cross community work between um, areas that were basically segregated you know like a Protestant area or a Catholic area and um, they was trying to bring mainly young people together um, which young people are very good at coming together um, when there's like space and when there's no uh, gatekeepers or people overseeing, you know, their attitudes. Um, and a lot of these sculptures would be, would grow from the community. You know, they'd have to grow out of the community. They'd have to be rooted deeply in it. Um, and they'd be based around ideas that they would see as important. Um, and you would do lots of workshops with kids and, and parents and things like that as well. 
talk about doing Dr. Luke as long as we're talking about that, because that's okay. one of those where you involve children. And okay, so one of the sculpture projects I was involved in was a community project um, in a place, a West Belfast, a place called Twinbrook. And in that area, there'd been lots of tragic deaths amongst young people. Um, there'd been suicides, um, lots of suicides. Um, there'd been joyriding incidents where they'd steal a car, drive through it army checkpoint or a police checkpoint. Sometimes the police would open up with it. I mean, been, young people have been killed. Um, there've been joyriders, they're called people who steal cars. It's, it's actually not joyriding, but that's the, the nickname. Who'd been um, killed in that way. And there'd been joyriders who'd killed other young people who'd been in the car. So in this community, um, which is mainly a nationalist, um, Roman Catholic community, um, I was invited in to speak to a community leader, a worker, um, a really amazing lady called um, Anne. And um, she said, look, we'd like to do something. We'd like to put something in place for families who lost a young life. And there's quite a lot of them. Um, could you help with some ideas? I said, yeah, I, um, I mean, this is quite, if you want to do like a sculpture, it's quite an expensive thing to do. Don't worry about that. We'll." we'll deal with that you know we'll get the funding sorted out and um, we want to know what your idea is i said you want me to tell you that now yeah that's why you're here <laughs> um i was a bit nervous because i'd never been in that community before and um um i said well where's the sculpture gonna go she's just gonna go in the grounds of st luke's church just over there so it was a catholic parish church called st luke's and she said well what's your ideas I said, well, I don't really, you know, this is the first meeting we've had. What? You're bound to have some kind of idea? I said, okay, okay. Well, if I was going to do a sculpture in this community, I would do a sculpture of St. Luke as a young doctor uh, coming into this community um, as a healer. And he would be taking on all those hearts that have been damaged, that have been lost uh, as a physician and as a spiritual person, as a follower of Christ. And he'd be wearing this coat and this coat would be covered in hearts. And this would be a coat that he would wear to go to the great physician. And um, each family that lost a life would make a heart and it would be part of the pattern on Luke's coat, this young doctor. She said, that's brilliant. <laughs> Did you just think that up there now? I said, yeah. How'd you do that? I said, it's a mixture of creativity and fear. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she said, well, how would St. Luke what would he look like? I said, would it be like a young person today? It'd have to be someone that they could connect with and relate to. That's, that's amazing. Um, we're going to have to get this past the parish priest, you know. I said, right, okay. Um, we're going to have to set a meeting up. Yeah, I'll set the meeting up, don't worry. Um, so we set this meeting up and uh, we go to see the parish priest. And um, he's quite open to the idea. Before we go into the parochial house, and he says to me, um, he's not getting that St. Luke with sandals, you know. He's not going to be wearing sandals in a row. I said, Annie, don't, please, let me deal with this, okay? So the priest is saying, well, how do you see St. Luke? And he's being quite theological, and I answer all the right questions. And I said, look, I would see him as contemporary St. Luke, you know, as a young physician, as a follower of Christ. She said, that would be interesting. And how would you see him? I said, well, that's something I would work on with the kids. Yeah, but how would you see his stance? Because in Scripture... St. Luke was always going somewhere. He was always following Christ. And he was an outsider. He was a non-Gentile writer. And he recorded the outsiders in his gospel. I said, yeah, well, that's how I see him as well. And I'd want to make him almost on the move. Yes, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, this will have to go to the bishop. <laughs> so that goes up. Then it goes to the bishop. And then I get this phone call. You need to come to a parochial meeting. There's an issue about the St. Luke sculpture. Um, and I supplied this drawing with a coat, you see, and the coat of hearts. So I go to the meeting and there's the parochial council. And um, they said, look, we've got this letter from the bishop. Shoot me the letter. So the concern is that Luke's coat's too short. <laughs> but they wanted a longer coat. And I could sort of get the idea of that because it would look more robe-like. Hmm. Um, and um, so I lengthened the coat and that wasn't a problem. But actually, it looked better. 
um, because you could get more hearts on as well. Mm. And I didn't realize there were so many families that had suffered loss and that had been hurt. So that project was a big thing. And that community came together for the unveiling of that, that sculpture. It was about, I would say, three or 400 people, which was like a massive amount. So you had children draw hearts, am I right? Um, I, I went to the local primary school, which was called St. Luke's Primary School. And um, we did this art project of what St. Luke should look like. And they did a portrait um, of this young, well, they, they had the ideas and then we made this composite image. Um, and then we stuck hearts onto the, the painting and the painting hung in the, f in the entrance hall of the school. It was to get parents to see and to become knowledgeable about it. So they helped, they helped design that. I mean, obviously I took their ideas and, and, and you know, like modeled them into like this um, sort of heroic and, and brave and, 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 and uh, Christian figure. Um, and that's how that became a bite. And the day it was unveiled, um, Father Murray came to me and said, look, Ross, I know this might not be in your theological landscape, but I'm going to be blessing the sculpture. Um, and I, I thought that was a really amazing honor mm. that he did that. And it's been one of the sculptures that's been really well looked after because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still a really poignant. Oh, it's moving. Yeah, it is. Anchor. It is a moving yeah. piece. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to I want to get you to talk about two names I've heard you mention over and over again. Talk to me about your interest in uh, C.S. Lewis. One of the um, things that I was able to experience is your little uh, C.S. Lewis tour that you took me on. I mean, how many years ago was that? That's easily about 18 or 19 years ago. Yeah. Uh, some of the C.S. Lewis sites there in Northern Ireland. Talk about C.S. Lewis, his impact on you, uh, why that's a important figure in your life. Um, well, that, that all started way back when I was a student um, around the time of my conversion. And someone had bought me a book um, by C.S. Lewis. And I, I, I remember taking it to London with me when I went to do my postgrad and reading it and sort of got into him then. Um, and I mean, I didn't at that time then get other books, but that stayed with me like deeply. Um, and then when I came back and after a few years, I started paying more attention to him. And the more attention I paid to him, the more, and this is gonna sound a bit weird, um, I, I got to know him and and also to, to love him. Um, I found him a very compassionate man and a, a very, um, a man with grace mm. and we need as as men believe it or not we need men with grace in our lives Amen. Um, we need people to look up to thankfully I've met a few um, in, in recent years and found myself at more, I mean it's weird to admire another man for all the right reasons because um, people admire men sometimes for the wrong reasons mm. and those reasons lead nowhere you know, they're nothing but to find men who are grace filled mm. and who live out in front of you a Christ shaped life. Mm. I mean, even at my old age, I'm still you know, I'm still trying to get to that place. Sure. And so to see these people um like that and to experience Lewis like that in his work, and in that letter in particular, is a big insight that not a lot of people would know about that, you know, that he took time to do that. Um that really got into me. And, and, and became like a big passionate thing for me. And so the more I got to know him through his work, um, the more that informed me and the more that gave me, um, I don't know what you say, intellectual, spiritual um, resources to help communicate to other people. Um, so Lewis is, is a, a big figure in my life um, because he's one of those men of grace that I still look up to, and that I'm constantly looking up to more and more, the more I find out about him. And that place I took in the tour was called Castle Rock, mm. which is a beautiful little sea town, sea, sea, seaside town, that Flora Lewis took Jack and Warney to for their first holidays. And, and the house, two houses that they stayed in are still there. It hasn't really changed that much. And it's a very beautiful area, like it's it's, mesmerizingly beautiful mm. 
and you can see where the whole Narnian thing started off there in childhood because if you look at a map of Narnia in the books it mimics the coast from Donegal down through the North Antrim coast to the mountains of Morne and there's a castle uh, marked on the map and there's a castle on part of that coast called the Luce. and um, that's the castle that most Lewis scholars say influenced Park Carvel in, in the Chronicles of Narnia so that imaginary landscape in Lewis's um, the, the landscape in Lewis's young childhood life helped inform the imaginary landscape in, in his later life. So um, Lewis said amazing things, and he said things in a sentence that people could write a four-page essay about. You know, um, God doesn't want anything from us. He simply wants us. You know, God does not love us because we're lovable. Mm. God loves us because he is love. Mm. Um, God does not love us because he wants to receive. God loves us because he wants to give. Mm. Um, you know, those little strap lines, you know, from his, I think, from your Christianity are important things to carry around with you. Mm. Um, so he, 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 he would be uh, my really important imaginary friend, um, C.S. Lewis. And maybe you've already done this, but I'd like you to do it more specifically. A comment from your perspective on why C.S. Lewis c continues to have this global influence. It's just an amazing thing. Um, because he hits the heart. He hits the heart. And the heart hasn't really changed. The heart, if anything, is becoming more deceptive. You know, the deception that the heart can become... Um, involved in now is so high ranking it's unbelievable so Lewis touched on that you know in his life but that heart hasn't changed you know um, and that's why those writings still work they're almost like evergreen um, they're not going to go out of date um, it's, it's still the same condition that man needs dealt with you know that condition of sin that condition of you thinking you know better that condition of I do this nobody's going to know about it but I'll get away with it <clears throat> all those things that we entrap ourselves by all those things that we decoy ourselves by all those things that we um, create you know almost like a, a fake self or a fragmented self through Lewis dealt with those um, and, and, and that's not going to go out of date yeah, the, the self-deceptive lies are, are all the same. The, the settings change, yeah, but they're all the same. So, uh, and also the encouragement that he gives in his work and, and, and the glory he gives to God and the help that he gives to us and the signposts he gives to us and the spiritual satnav that he has worked out, you know, um, to help us are, are so important. And, and he did it so well. And like, if you think about, if you go into any Christian bookshop, and they're probably bigger in America than they are in, in Ireland, in terms of the size of them, and look at all those bookshelves and all the books that are there, um, how many of those books will be remembered in, 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 in four years time, hmm. even in a year's time, some of them, hmm. um, or, you know, like even six months time. Um, but yet, you know, his, his writing is still there. It's still powerful. It's still vigorous. Um, it's still got this uplift of grace in it. Mm. This uplift of grace. Absolutely. So there's another name, uh, Van Gogh, or so the people watching this from America understand who I'm talking about, Van Gogh. <laughs> uh, talk about your interest in him and what we, we don't know about him that we should know. Well, my interest in Vincent van Gogh um, started when I was about 14, around that time when my art teacher um, tapped into my life. Um, at that time, I wasn't a believer. I was hanging around with like, like it's going to sound like a movie, like a teenage gang. Um, but we would, we would go to parties in people's houses and we, we would be drinking, you know, alcohol and we'd be doing things that we shouldn't be doing as 14, 15 year olds. And um, I sort of knew it wasn't good. You'd go to a house, there'd be a party, end up, you know, like trashing the furniture, all that kind of stuff. It was just like silliness. Um, there was no real, like, 
a darkness to it. It was just like stupidity. Um, but I remember we went to this house one night. Um, I do remember the house is. I actually found out who the people were later uh, who lived in it. But they had bookshelves. We'd never been to a party in the house that had bookshelves. <laughs> they had books on the bookshelves as well. And this girl's brother had a like a stereo and he was like a DJ. He was putting, I mean, he wasn't a very active DJ, but he was putting like L LP albums on. And I, this was like quite a nice place. I thought, well, this is unbelievable. Um, we saw these books. Me and another guy, who I actually ended up going to art college with, um, ended up below the table with a Van Gogh book. While all our friends were dancing and drinking and we were below the table. And then somebody said, what are they? What are those? What are those two down below the table? And everybody's looking down. We're, you know, we've had a eureka moment yeah. with Vincent Van Gogh in this art book. And I'd never really seen an art book in a house. Um, I'd seen one in my classroom at school because um, there were a few in the, in, the, in the bookshelf there. And this is such a big moment. Um, we decided to tear our favorite painting out of the book. And I remember turning out, I think it was Vincent's bedroom, painting did of his bedroom. No, oh, yeah. Like folding it up and putting it in the back pocket. And then my friend tore up and we put the book back up. <laughs> so that that happened there. And then I started to like look into him. And I remember there was this brilliant movie, um, made in 1957, um, directed by Vincent Di Manelli, starring Kirk Douglas as Vincent van Gogh and um, Anthony Quinn as Paul Gauguin. And Anthony Quinn won the Best Supporting Oscar that year for that role. But Kirk Douglas's role as Vincent van Gogh was amazing. And in the movie, which is based on a book by Irving Stone called Lust for Life, Irving Stone was an American writer, he bought a book of letters that had been published by Vincent van Gogh's sister-in-law, Johanna, who was married to Theo. And it was Johanna, or Joe as they called her, who kept all the work together, who collated the letters, who published the letters, who organized the exhibitions. If Joe hadn't have done this, we would not know anything about Vincent van Gogh, because all that stuff would have just been depleted. The letters would probably have been burned or binned or whatever. Mm. So she was behind that. So this book, Lost for Life, was based on the letters that Irving Stone wrote. Then it was it became this movie. So it was like a like a sort of dramatized biography. And then part of the movie, um, I remember watching it. I thought, you know, he's studying, he wants to be a missionary. He wants to reach out to people. His father was a reformed Dutch pastor. And um, Vincent um, wanted to become a pastor, a missionary, and was sort of like frustrated by the system that he had to go through to go and study theology, Greek. He was a very intelligent person. He could write and speak in three different languages. So he ended up as a young man in his early 20s as a missionary in Belgium in an area called the Bornege, which was nicknamed the land of the Black Pyramids. These giant coal heaps. It was a coal mining area. And that was an area nobody else wanted to go. And he went there as a young man to mission into the lives of these miners. And they had a nickname for him. They called him the Christ of the Mines because he went down the mines with them when there was a cave in or when there was an explosion. He tore up his shirts for bandages, his bed sheets. He gave away his bed. He moved into a little shack in the village. He lay on a bed of straw on the floor and he identified with these people. The missionary oversight came to find him covered in coal dust and living this very basic life and said to him, you need to be setting an example of these people. Why are you living like this? You're being excessively zealous about your mission. And he said, if I am to preach Christ, I am to live like Christ. Hmm. And they cut his support off. And he stayed for another while and then had to leave because he had no money. And he walked away from the preached life. He walked out of that preached life into the painted life. And he started painting at the age of 27. By the age of 37, he was dead. And what he'd done in those 10 years would change the course of art history forever because he was the father of modern art. Did he have training? Um, he was self-taught, basically. He did go to a couple of, um, I don't know, classes, but it was all self-taught because he developed a new style of painting. Um, he was very influenced by 
the Dutch Northern Light and his early paintings are very moody and very earthy and the Potato Weeders is a very earthy painting and he talked about the idea of these people who planted the potatoes and then harvested them and they were having this meal of communion and it was very dark and very Rembrandt-esque in terms of the colour palette. Mm. But when he moved away from Holland to the south of France, it was like a big giant spotlight had been switched on and everything just burst into colour. And some of his greatest masterpieces were painted in the last two years of his life. Um, just in the last two years. He would paint easily like 100, 150 p pictures a year. He'd do hundreds of sketches and, and he wrote 650 approximately 650 letters to his brother in a 10-year period. So you could find out what he was doing on a certain day. And after he preached, when he was a young man, his first sermon in, uh, in, in, in London, um, and he went to hear C.H. Spurgeon preach, by the way, which links into your promo of Spurgeon's work at the start. Um, he wrote to his brother Theo about having preached his first sermon, which was on Psalm 119, verse 19. And he said, Theo, basically, you know, when I stood at the bottom of the pulpit steps and walked up, I knew I had to have the light of God in my heart. And that to preach the gospel, you need to be truly born again. And um, a brilliant letter. And also then he writes out the sermon and sends it to Theo as well. And I thought, that's amazing. Um, so there was a young man who had God in his life and his heart, who was hurt um, by that blessed, blessed gift of discouragement. Hmm but who then find another way to communicate God's creativity um, through what he saw and what he did. And he was no saint. You know, Vincent was no saint, um, like, like the rest of us, in one sense. Um, but he did pursue that mission. And he was troubled. He had mental health issues. He had epilepsy. He had a condition, which I discovered just last year through reading letters um, to Theo. He had auditory nerve dysfunction which was this terrible, like, I don't know how to explain it, this, I don't know, like this ringing in the inner ear, mm. uh, which was brought on by trauma. And that famous incident about cutting of the ear, in the letter, Vincent's writing to Theo, said he's had a discussion with this young doctor, Dr. Felix Ray. And Dr. Felix Ray has been treating other patients who have had auditory nerve dysfunction and also epilepsy. And he said that several of these other patients have tried to cut their ear off because of this terrible noise. So that put a whole new angle on this madman, you know, yeah. who was uh, living a life of chaos. Um, he was just like um, all over the place. Um, it put a whole new direction on that. I mean, that cliche is wrong, of course. Sure. You know, um, you couldn't do the things he did uh, if you were mad, you know, um, because the things he did were amazing and touch people's lives. If you go to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam tomorrow morning, there'll be a, in fact, you'll have to book weeks ahead to get in. There'll be a queue of people outside waiting to get in. Why is that? Why do people still read Lewis and are touched by him? Why do people stand in front, front of the Vincent Van Gogh painting? Why last year when I was in New York, did I go to a MoMA to see Starry Night and sit in front of it for two hours? Mm. Um, because there's something happening there between the temporal and the eternal. And that person who has made that artwork or that piece of literature has experienced that. And that is experienced in the presence of God. Yeah, powerful. And talk about his impact on on the development of, of art. Um, well, I mean, he was misunderstood and no one really understood. I mean, there were people around him, a close circle. Um, his brother believed in him, his, his brother's wife, Jo, and there was a few other young artists and um, who were gathering around him t at the age of 27, just when he died. And, and young critics were starting to write about him. Um, but he, 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 you know, I mean, his work isn't overly complex. It's just about this idea of being ahead of this curve of, I don't know, like, the ordinary, you know, he was in one sense celebrating the ordinary, but in a way that was so um, upbeat and so full of light and so full of color and so full of heat um, that those works affect you in that way. And that Starry Night painting is really, I, I consider it the birth of modern art. Modern art. Mm. You know, that painting where with the cosmic sky 
the night village where there's a light on in every house in the village and there's a church with no lights on um the allegory the and he painted that from the asylum room window um where basically he was going through rehab you know this wasn't someone who was being tied down to a bed he went in there voluntary he had a room that he slept in and he had a room as a studio so the starry night was painted through the window there was no village outside the window he put it in the church in the village which is french was of dutch architecture so I think that links back to the time when he was hurt by the church. Hmm. Um, and then there's this cosmic array of almost like starry fireworks happening in the sky um, where eternity and time again meet. So that painting opened the door for other artists like Matisse, Picasso, Brack, um, who would have looked at that and thought, whoa, you know, that's what happened there. You know, who opened that window? Um, so that that work and other works like it would have um, pushed that door wide open and so an artist who died in obscurity and there were 14 people at his funeral um, the parish priest wouldn't let me use a hearse because he was a suicide his brother had to borrow, borrow a, a hearse from another um, village um, his first exhibition was at his funeral um, where Theo put the paintings around the little inn where he, where he lodged um, and the coffin was sat there and, and the paintings were around the coffin almost like a halo and there was bunches of yellow sunflowers on top of the coffin on this hot July day um, when he was laid to rest and he'd sold one painting that year one painting so what happened what happened to turn that around what happened when that coffin was lowered into the ground that day when Vincent went down he came up mm. you know and he came up through his work because he was faithful to that mission Wow. So I have one final question for you. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> um, what I want to do with the rest of my life is um, to try and reach somewhere with my work um, that I've been trying to get to since that journey started. Um, and that's to a place where you're saying something that's relevant and something that has a quality attached to it and something that is holy and something that is worthy and something that will touch other people's lives. Sounds like a, a worthy goal. Well, thank you.